So I paid three dollars for this app, and after using the app, I was super unsatisfied with the content, and I was so disappointed that I actually decided to step up and learn how to code so I can build what I think that app should have been. The only way that I can get the experience that I wanted was by working on my own personal projects. You know, as a developer, you never want to use someone else's stuff. You want to roll your own. Hey, this is Brian, and you're listening to Jamstack Radio, a bi-weekly series where we discuss the Jamstack, a new way of building websites and apps that are fast, secure, and simple to work with. Jamstack Radio is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. Welcome to another installment of Jamstack Radio. On the line, we've got Nick De Jesus. Welcome, Nick. Hi. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Nick, we just jump right in. I'm just curious, uh, you want to tell the listeners why you're here and, um, and what you do? Yeah, well, I'm here because you invited me, which I'm very happy about. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. So I've been coding for about five years. I'm self-taught. To break things down, Like I am a Tekken player, first and foremost. And what inspired me to get into coding was wanting to make an app for my community. We all travel for tournaments and stuff, and we want to hold on to certain information and whatnot. And so I had no idea how to code. I just knew that I had an app I wanted to build. And to just basically condense everything, since then I've just been kind of making projects based on like itches that I want to scratch. Right now I'm working at Resilient Coders, which is a boot camp focused on black and brown people getting into the tech industry. We pay them to learn how to code. And after about 20 weeks, we place them into some pretty well paying jobs and we try to keep them away from like the titles of junior or internships or apprenticeships and whatnot. Wow. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where like I skipped a whole bunch of stuff, obviously, because it's just so much. But yeah, that's pretty much like me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm curious if your story is out there. Maybe other people can catch up on like how you got to where you're at. I'm also curious too as well. You you said you wanted to build an app for your community. Do you want to Talk more about what that is. Yeah, so I'm a tournament player, right? And so I've traveled to tournaments throughout America. I've been to tournaments in Thailand and Scotland. But tournaments uh, for for what is it? Tekken tournaments. It's a fighting game. Oh, Tekken. Okay, I missed that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just assume everyone knows it because like my whole community is like centered around Tekken right now. So basically, we study information on the characters and the fighting mechanics called frame data. And it tells you how fast attacks are, what they do when it hits people, what happens when it, attacks are blocked and whatnot. Uh, so that's pretty much where I was as far as like, like my hobbies and interests and stuff. And somebody released an app that would help you get a hold of this frame data offline because people were doing weird stuff. They were downloading HTML pages and stuff like that. I paid for the app and I don't know if you are aware, but it is very hard to get an Android user to pay for anything. <laughs> I've heard that, yeah. And so I paid $3 for this app. And after using the app, I was super unsatisfied with the content. It was like all top 10 moves of every character. Each character has like 70 to 100 different moves. I was like, this is not enough. And I was so disappointed that I actually decided to step up and learn how to code so I can build what I think that app should have been. So right now, it's in the iOS and Android store called T7 Chicken Plus. It's actually like my third version. And the reason why it's called Plus is because it's like a huge upgrade from like my second one, because I've been growing <laughs> as a developer. Yeah. Uh, and I think that project alone has attributed to pretty much all of my growth. It helped me dive into more into React and Redux, working with React Native, I was working at like an agency where I wasn't learning like anything at all. Yeah. And the only way that I can get the experience that I wanted was by working on my own personal projects. And so T7 Chicken is like a manifestation of me wanting to learn and grow and also bring value to a community. I think it has over 30,000 users right now. Wow. That's amazing. And uh, I'm a little ashamed because I kind of abandoned it post COVID. <laughs> So, 
I got to dust it off one of these days, but I'm not sure when that'll be. Well, it's not too long. I mean, I've got projects I haven't touched in like years. Actually, <laughs> one project I'm working on right now, I didn't touch in like probably a year and a half. And I'm just now, now it's actually starting to pick up. I don't have 30,000. I have 65 yeah. users as of today. So I mean, that's something. It is something. And I had one before I actually started cleaning it up, which was me. So <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm happy to have more than one user. That's for sure. Yeah. I think like if you got like a personal project, I just kind of work on it when I feel like it. You know, I don't want to feel pressured to always consistently, especially if it's not making me money, you know? Yeah, that's wild. I haven't played Tekken since probably the Dreamcast days. So like I'm I'm pretty like talk about dusty, like that's that's my skill level <laughs> for sure. But uh I, I'm actually I did play a lot of Street Fighter recently. Um mm-hmm. but uh yeah, I don't know if there's like a whole rivalry between Street Fighter and, and Tekken or not. <sighs> Not, not really. Especially now in Tekken Seven, they dropped Street Fighter characters in it, and oh, really? so now all the Tekken players are mad uh, about that. Yeah, and Akuma's insane, <laughs> but we could talk about that another time, yeah, like over yeah, drinks yeah. or well, something. We'll, we'll save it for the picks. <laughs> we'll, we'll pick our, our favorite, our favorite Tekken and Street Fighter players. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Maybe we chat about the project that I, I was really interested in hearing about, which is the the shopping cart. Yes, uh, you shopping cart. Yes, uh, I'm curious of how you got to that point. Is that also related to T Seven Chicken? Yes, actually. So pretty much everything I've ever done as a developer is like the, at the start of it all is something to do with T7 Chicken. <laughs> Which is like, maybe maybe create like a different name that had more of the origination. I know. And so basically, I got the 30,000 users. Yeah. I'm not making money from this project. And I've said, okay, 30,000 users, it's time to try to cash in on this somehow. And so I wanted to make like a little swag store. And, you know, of course there's Shopify and all these other things, but, you know, as a developer, you never want to use someone else's stuff. You're, yeah. You want to roll your own. Also your Android user, so you don't want to pay. Exactly. Exactly. And so basically I started trying to make this happen on my own and there were so many pain points I came across. And then like to sidetrack myself, I also was like, I might want to do this multiple times and I hate boilerplate code like copying and pasting and stuff. So that's when I caught wind of uh, Gatsby themes. So Gatsby themes pretty much allow you to, you could create whole entire websites and do something called component shadowing. Like you can leave it as is, or you can shadow a component to sort of like overwrite it in a way and, and manipulate it in the way that you need. And I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. So instead of learning like Gatsby directly, I jumped right in and decided to learn how to build themes. Okay. And so I started building this Gatsby Stripe theme for the e-commerce experience. And I think that's where I got a lot of my traction because like Gatsby was doing a lot of promotional stuff at the time and people were trying to jump in and learn Gatsby. And then I realized uh, there's a whole series of events I'm going to skip over. (laughs) But I realized what was significant about the Gatsby theme wasn't so much the ability to launch an e-commerce store in a matter of minutes by itself, but like the shopping cart logic is what people wanted. And so people are trying to use my theme and some people aren't even interested in Gatsby. They're like, well, what if I want to use your shopping cart, but I don't want to use Gatsby? And I was like, huh. (laughs) And so I was supposed, well, I am supposed to be creating an egghead lesson around how to actually make this library. And uh, they were telling me that like their process is to have a workshop before it becomes an actual course. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, I wrote such horrible code for the shopping cart. I was like, there's no way I can do this live for a workshop. Like, that's just not, that's not it. So there was two things I was trying to do there. I was like, one, trying to make it available for any React developer. It doesn't matter what like framework or platform or whatever you want to use. And then the other piece was I did this so I can skip over trying to tell people how to build the shopping cart live in a workshop. And so it ended up getting a lot more traction than I expected. I was really just trying to scratch my own itch, which is like what motivates me to do anything. So I'm pretty excited for it, especially because I know right now it's like branded as a Stripe powered shopping cart thing, but we do have plans to open up to other platforms and just recently, I've had some conversations. I know that uh, in Africa, there's basically no support for e-commerce at all. Yeah. And so I'm working with somebody who is interested in trying to help me make this shopping cart work for African payment systems. Nice. So are you talking like like, like Flutterwave? 
Is that one of them? I am not a hundred percent sure. There was uh, whoever's helping is starting with Kenya, and I think they use something else. Okay, yeah, yeah. Flutter Wave, I think, is based out of Nigeria. Yeah, um, they might cover other countries, but yeah, they come to mind because they helped me out with the, one of the hackathons we did for for GitHub. Oh, nice. But yeah, that's wild though. That I'm just like blown away that you because I, I have a lot of side projects, but nothing that obviously has got thirty thousand users, but also nothing that I've ever been able to peel off an idea into another side project, if that makes sense. So like you're able to take T7 Chicken, which is an Android app, and create a swag store, but then take that swag store and make it available to other people, in addition to potentially having egghead courses and content around that too as well. Yeah, that's how I sort of prioritize things. Like I have this giant list of things that I would love to accomplish, and there's all kinds of variables for priorities, but a lot of things that I choose first are things that sort of feed into others just to sort of like get as much done with the least, it feels weird saying the least amount of effort because it's so much work, (laughs) but you know, I'm covering everything like every hitting like one area is going to make it easier for the other areas that I'm trying to get into as well. And it also helps with like, you know, I do like teaching and helps with like my engagement and stuff too and getting stuff out there, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a good way to look at things too as well, especially if you look at, a lot of times we uh, people just want to ship something to you know make a lot of money or start a startup or you know scratch an itch. Yeah. But when you look at the bigger picture of like, if I take the time to learn Gatsby or Gatsby themes like you did, like what will this lead me to eventually? Or yeah. how can I take something that's successful like T7 Chicken but build something else that's probably going to be more successful. I'm not sure. We didn't talk about like adoption for a used shopping cart. Like, if you're getting a lot of users, a lot of feedback. Yeah. So, uh, if I check, I think I'm over. I have like 200 something stars, and there are 30 people using it. And some of them are like people testing things out. Stripe has created examples on their own with Next and stuff. Oh, nice. Which is cool because I'm like super into Gatsby. It's nice knowing that people are building like Next content. And I'm actually waiting for someone to actually launch like an e-commerce store with it, you know, like, so this is all very recent. This is all very new, probably maybe a two or three months in the making. So, oh, really? Wow. I, for some reason I thought you, this thing was, you've been working on for a bit. No, no, I felt, no. I fell out of the loop because like, I've never heard of it before. Like, why am I not building <laughs> stuff yeah. with this? You haven't heard of it because it's literally brand new. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah. And so I'm waiting for that. I actually am trying to help somebody personally launch their own e-commerce thing. It's going to be like a pain relief cannabis oil thing. This guy's like really good at making that kind of stuff. So I personally want to launch his site with my own tools. Yeah. So I'll probably be the first to launch an e-commerce store with my own thing, but I'm waiting for that kind of adaptation. I do have a discord that's on the doc site. And so uh, people are joining the Discord and asking questions on how to use it and stuff like that. So I'm getting the engagement and stuff. It's just very early, which is why I want to also focus on making all this content and stuff around it to get people to adopt it. Yeah, and that, that brings up something I wanted to bring up too as well. Like I've got so much I want to ask you and talk about. So I know of you because of GitHub sponsors. Like you reached out to my tweet. Yes, thank and you. Got you on there so much. Like that was really inspiring. Yeah, and that was like that came through. And I haven't haven't talked about this publicly a lot, but like the the U.S. particularly is coming through some really interesting changes and lots of protest. And me as a black male, like I've just been really struggling on what, like, what is my part in this and what am I doing? Like, I'm not a protester. Like, I'm not down downtown Oakland doing stuff. But I'm really focused on like how I can actually support my community. Yeah. So I was just sort of like looked at my GitHub sponsors and people I was sponsoring. It was like, all these are familiar faces, which is great. But I'd love to support like who can I help in my community. So I think you were the first person to respond to my tweet on a Saturday morning, which I appreciate that. And I think a lot of other people appreciated that because they all jumped on the bandwagon. <laughs> but I'm curious if your your side of the experience on how that that works because I know it directly correlates to the amount of work you've been able to put into you shopping cart and stuff like that. Yeah. So first of all, I want to say thank you. I have 22 people donating from that tweet. A lot of them are people from GitHub too, which is kind of cool. Yeah. As well as uh, I've got some people donating from Stripe at the same time. So I'm at almost 500 a month. And 
I didn't plan for this. Like, I still actually have no idea where I'm going to go with it. But I think for now, I'm going to be like at least sending email updates to the sponsors. And I don't know if you saw that tweet the other day. One guy is like making like 100K from GitHub sponsors. Yeah, 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 Caleb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's great timing for you because it came out right after you ended up adopting a bunch, a bunch of sponsors. But it also sounds like, so Caleb, I don't know if you're going to go in this, but Caleb was talking about how he sort of got to the 100K mark for GitHub sponsors through content yeah. and engagement. Sort of just laid it all out. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like you're almost there. That was exactly my plan. And it's super validating to see the biggest thing I wanted to do. So I actually have a couple plans with this, right? So I have this library and there's a point where not literally, but this shopping cart library is going to be quote unquote done, right? Like there's only so much you can do with the shopping cart. Yeah. What I hope to do is create a lot of educational content for using it. So I'm starting with Jamstack stuff with both Gatsby and Next. And I also hope to have a sort of SaaS, which would be like a super mini CMS that integrates with the shopping cart library itself. Like uh, my initial MVP stuff will be, you know, product creation, inventory management, and you won't have to host your own server. You can use my serverless implementation, right? And that's like my starting point for now. But I also want to open source those pieces. So it's always going to be an option. I think I'm going to start off like as a SaaS first. And then like when things are going well, then I'll open it up to open source. And so... Of course, if I get the kind of donations that can like allow me to put more energy and time into it, like the faster that kind of stuff will get done. Yeah, we should chat. Yeah, because uh, there, there might be some overlap. Uh, so I haven't started working on it, but I want to do a swag store for one of my projects. Nice. Like I've got a nice brand which is open sourced. <laughs> um, it was like one of those deals where like if you're in like a, a group or you're in like a band, you spend more time on the design and like the logo than actually doing any like playing music. Yeah. Open source is definitely that for me where I spend way more time on the design and less on the actual code and the product. I've caught up now the actual product works, but I had for a couple of years I had a pretty sweet logo and nothing else to show for it. <laughs> so with that being said, I want to actually set up like a sticker shop and a swag store. Yes. And I haven't actually messed with Stripe directly in a while. So I'm not even sure. I know the API is great, but that's about it. I would love to help you. And yeah, like with this, with you shopping cart, you don't really need to know much about Stripe. Like you'll just need to know how to use you shopping cart. And yeah, like it would be perfect for a sticker store stuff right now. The biggest hurdle right now for me is the inability to sort of create a variance and I think like it, it'll be easy for a developer themselves to create something that has variants and stuff. I kind of wish Stripe's dashboard had a variant thing, but outside of that, like I would love to help. <laughs> it's perfect for sticker stores. I think somebody's actually using it for a sticker store right now. Okay, yeah, I'm just kind of blown away on this uh, this experience. I'm also curious, like there's a lot of other, and especially in the Jamstack space, like a lot of other like shopping cart. Stores and then like Shopify has their thing, yep. and I'm not sure how watered down like you can make that. Like Stripe is nice because you can sort of put it anywhere. Yep. Shopify is nice because it does everything for you. So I'm curious of like, is there talks of making like a, a paid component around the shopping cart stuff? Or are you just sort of just scratching an itch still and trying to figure it out yourself? Yeah. So I think that paid component is probably most likely going to be like that CMS aspect. Yeah. So ultimately. In the grand, grand, grand scheme of things, I actually care more about like non-technical slash like non-coder people. Yeah, I want to help them. However, I'm not really satisfied with the developer tooling for building the things that I would like to build. Yeah, and so now I'd like to build the developer tooling and sort of see where I can go from there. And so, like the headless CMS is going to be that paid component. I don't know if I'm going to do something like what Snipcart does or what Shopify does. Like with Gatsby, I've been trying to figure out ways to sort of launch websites with like no code at all. Yeah. You know, sort of like how card works. So you're you're speaking on something that like resonates with me a lot, the questions you're asking, but I'm still so early in the game that I have to see where I fall at this point, you know? 
Yeah. Like my, my priorities right now. So keep that, sh- the shopping cart thing open source itself, which I think was like a really great learning experience for me. It was really fun to work on. And was it the first thing you open sourced that had like adoption? I have never done anything in open source ever before. This is my first open source thing ever. Wow. Like I've done small contributions to like maybe docs or something for like React Native or something in that eco space. But like, I've never been interested at any point in my life have I ever considered myself being any kind of open source person. Yeah. Like not even just a maintainer. Like I would think about open source stuff and I'd be like, yeah, I'm totally not interested in that. And so this is my first open source project. I have contributors. So Thor, he's a Stripe developer advocate. He's actually a core contributor himself. That is awesome. And uh, and I also have another contributor, uh, Chris Brownie, 55 on GitHub. He has been a tremendous amount of help as well. And so then there's other, if you look at my all contributors list, there's like a bunch of people who have done like little things here and there and stuff. So yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, this is my first thing ever. And it just happened to pick up a lot of traction. And I'm very like lucky <laughs> and grateful for it all. Yeah. I would say that was wild, but honestly, of all the open source maintainers I've chatted with, either here or outside of this podcast, a lot of people sort of fall into things. Yeah. Like it's very similar. There's some people who are just sort of like serial open source maintainers. They will just have an idea, spin it up, make it work, and then it grows and then they walk away. Yeah. Or they continue to maintain it, whatever it is. But then a lot of people sort of just sort of fell into an idea. And I think I think what's interesting about your approach of building tools for non developers is that there are a lot of non-developers out there that have really great ideas but don't know how to code. Yep. And there are a lot of developers who have no ideas but know how to code. Yeah, yeah. So like being able to sort of mirror that mix of individuals and like think outside the box for for things cuz like it could have been just as easy for you to sign up for Shopify. Oh yeah. And add a bunch of uh, a bunch of your logo stuff to Shopify and then you're you're good. And then you pay whatever the 25%, 15 I'm not sure what it is for Shopify, but pay the cut. Yep. And then, yeah, you move on. We wouldn't be here um, right now. No. <laughs> and I'd, have, I'd probably be making money from T7 Chicken. <laughs> yeah. I still never did that. <laughs> wow. I mean, there's other, other realms, I guess. I don't know. But I guess GitHub Sponsors is, is working out well for you. Hopefully that continues to grow. Yeah. And uh, it's a, like really a testament of like, open source doesn't have to be 100% free. It doesn't have to be all your free time and then you get no glory or glamour. And it doesn't have to just be like, a lot of people use open source as your resume building experience as well. Right. Like it, it can be all that stuff. But also like if you want to work on something and something you care about the most and maybe until people figure it out and like find it's a good idea. Like, yeah, like there's so much inspiration in this like short chat that we, we've had so far. But I, I'm curious too as well. Like, I'm definitely going to check out the shopping cart. I'm definitely going to uh, set something up, like probably super simple up front, and try to figure out how to get my stickers out to, to people and all that sort of drop shipping and stuff like that. I'll figure that out eventually. But I'm curious about some other stuff you also are associated with. So I'm curious about this one thing that I, I'm really interested in, which is the Black Tech Pipeline. Uh, are you able to talk about that a little bit? Yes. So Black Tech Pipeline is going to be like a Hiring resource, um, resources page, and job board all in one. And it's focused on black and brown people. You know, for years, the conversation has always been like, hey, you know, employer, there's not enough black and brown people here. Why? And it's like, oh, well, it's a pipeline problem, right? Like, yeah. we're not getting enough black and brown people in the pipeline. And so Paris, she blew up on Twitter. Uh, it's funny, you said that you didn't really know of us until maybe about six or nine months ago or something like that. And so we are both actually kind of new to Twitter <laughs> okay. so in that regard. So we just yeah. kind of like, she blew up with that tweet. And there are thousands of black and brown engineers and technologists or whatever in that thread. And I mean, I have to admit for myself, even as somebody who was a software engineer at that time, if you had asked me like, Hey Nick, how many black and brown engineers are in the industry? I, pr- I would have started counting like on my hands, like yeah, you know what I'm saying. So no, I, we probably would have had the same list too as well. That's the other the right. sad part. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. What uh, Paris is doing is creating that space for employers to hire black and brown candidates. 
And so it's going to start off, I'm building it with Gatsby and we're using uh, forestry as a CMS. Oh, nice. Both guests on this podcast. Oh, nice. <laughs> and so the plan is like, there's going to be sort of a recruitment thing where a company can say, hey, I have this role. Can you find somebody out of your database? She's got like an Airtable database full of black and brown engineers. And she's going to like handle the recruitment piece. And I'm not going to go into the business specifics of that, but that's a thing. Yeah. Uh, and then there's going to be, uh, if a company doesn't want her to actually go and find candidates, they can post on, on her job board. And then there's going to be a resources page, which I could be wrong, but I think that's free. <laughs> like where... You know, if you're running something, some kind of program, or you have some event going on that's catered to black and brown people, you can just be on that page. And then if you, it also ties into her newsletter. Yeah, I'm definitely on that. I'm very proud of her. This is something she's really passionate about, you know, especially herself being an engineer and experiencing the, you know, the microaggressions and all that stuff. Like she has her own history of dealing with this and she knows, she knows how necessary this is, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. I look forward to um, like leveraging that and pointing people to that when it's available. Uh, and I hope listeners will also check it out. Yeah. As well as the blacktechpipeline.com. Is that going to be the... That will be it. If you go there right now, it's like a Shopify site to get stickers. Yeah. We're not ready to drop it just yet. Right now, she's actually having back-to-back meetings like all week for clients who want to be on part of the launch, the initial launch. Okay, excellent. Well, I look forward to that. Hopefully, hopefully it's soon. We've sort of already transitioned, but uh, I have this part of the podcast called The Picks, mm-hmm. um, where things you're jamming on, jam picks, uh, could be music, could be food, could be tech related. And if you don't mind, I'll go first. Actually, maybe you go first because you already mentioned Black Tech Pipeline. Yeah, do you have any other picks you want to want to mention? Yeah, so that would be my first pick, Black Tech Pipeline. And I want to choose Resilient Coders as the next pick, which is my current place of employment. I've been a mentor there for a couple of years before joining and whatnot. Again, coding bootcamp focused on black and brown technologists. We pay them to learn how to code and we hold the hiring partners to very high standards when it comes to recruiting from our boot campers. Is this for a specific city or is this uh, online? So right now it's just in Boston. We are doing remote classes, but we're still keeping it to Boston. The main reason is because, well, we understand like the needs of Boston tech companies. Yeah. We have better relationships and it's easier to support our students. Yeah. We would love to expand to other other cities, even if that means not necessarily making resilient coders available in another city, but helping other organizations create their own version of resilient coders. I think that's like in the books for like maybe two or three years. We still we're still perfecting our formula in Boston right now. All right, excellent. Yeah, I super appreciate organizations like that, like myself being a black engineer. Like I, I figured it out eventually, but like it wasn't an option for me. It didn't. Yeah. Despite me having you know decent grades and a college degree, I didn't take the route of computer science because I didn't think that was a path that made sense. Yeah. And in hindsight, I wish I took that decision. But right again, like I'm sure you deal with a lot of college educated people, people who just had a whole other degree, a whole other career, and I think, especially in the days of COVID too, as well where unemployment is the highest that it's ever been. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Like, there's a lot of people who are looking for jobs. The most recent cohort graduated a few weeks ago. Uh, I think it was maybe 17 or 18 of them. Right now, uh, we were able to place half of them. Wow. Which is like kind of crazy considering the times and stuff. So Yeah, the times and the influx of... like because. Engineers are not; they were not omitted from the the layoffs. Right, like there are definitely companies who have like laid off a lot of their staff, including engineers. Yep. So there's an influx of experience now in the market too, as well, looking for jobs. In addition to people who just learned that at a boot camp, so it's a challenging time, and I, I wish everybody the best. Yeah. But with that being said, I'm going to move into my picks, which is going to be, I guess, a little less deep, but then also deep as well. Uh, so anyway, I gave a, a, a talk at Juneteenth Conf. Juneteenth is a, a day that commemorates two years after the Emancipation Proclamation in the U.S. It took two years for the last group of slaves to actually be freed, and they had to be told because it was an information just was not accessible at that time in the 1800s. And the talk itself goes into open source as another information not being accessible, mm. like you just being new to open source. Like it's a thing that's been around your entire career as an engineer, and same with me. But there's a piece of like valuable 
information that's just not being shared widely with the, the tech community, especially developers. And that was that's what that talk was about. Mm. So please check it out. June Team Conf. It's on. Let's look for Brian Douglas and on YouTube. Uh, and then my last pick is going to be less serious, but I just ordered some pie online. Nice. There's a pie shop in Oakland <laughs> called Pietisserie. And uh, this is like definitely a bit of hard week. Uh, it's been a hard month. And I'm, I'm looking forward to some cherry pie and some nice. pe- pecan pie. Pecan pie, pecan pie. Uh, me and my wife. Pecan. We, I've never heard pecan. Yeah, we're, uh, my wife and I, my wife's from Louisiana. I'm from Florida. So we say things different. Yeah, yeah. But she's a fan of the, the pecan pie. And uh, I'm looking forward to get that. I'm actually getting it tomorrow. Nice. But if you could order pie from home, now is the time. I would look forward to, like, perhaps we can build a pie website using <laughs> use shopping cart. And then that way everybody can have pie. Yeah. Whenever they want it. Something in the jam stack. Yeah, the pie jam stack. For <laughs> sure. All right. I'm really I'm really leaning into this. Um, Nick, thanks for coming on, chatting about your open source, your efforts. You're touching a lot of stuff, which is amazing. Yes. I am spread so thin, but I'm also very happy. Yeah. And with that, listeners keep spreading the jam. That's all the time we have for today. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, find us on Twitter at Jamstack Radio. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com. And while you're there, check out their library. It's packed with amazing talks on sales, marketing, product, and general management from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders. 